Imagine lying on a scaffold, paintbrush in hand, staring at your masterpiece above you, awaiting your next brush stroke, when out of nowhere, the worst pain you've ever felt in your life stabs you in the side and you feel nauseated. You feel like you might pass out. Like Tim said, you feel like you might rather die. Well, this is how we think that the famous Italian artist Michelangelo may have felt while painting the Sistine Chapel some 500 years ago. We know that he had kidney stones later in his life, and we suspect that he actually had them earlier in his life, especially since during the four years of painting the Sistine Chapel, he actually had a six-month pause where he was unable to paint due to illness. We also know that it impacted his art, that is the study of urinary tract and also anatomy, in that uh, you see here in his image from the Sistine Chapel of God separating the earth from the waters, what appears to be an image of God positioned on a bisected kidney as it literally funnels the urine down below. <laughs> and this is, this is indeed real. Um, and, and in fact, I am a urologist, and um, we care for problems such as this, like obstructions from the urinary tract and other problems of a more sensitive nature. Yep, that's right, we're one of those doctors that no one wants to talk about in public, but they always want us when they need us. <laughs> but seriously, it's fascinating to uh, pontificate on what his life might have been like had Michelangelo known a modern-day urologist. Would it have taken him four years to paint the Sistine Chapel? Would, he have, would it have been more spectacular? Would it have been less? The reality is we'll never know because he lived in the 16th century. And we have indeed made a great deal of progress in the management of kidney stones since that time. And I want to share with you a little bit about what the scientific break breakthroughs and the technological advances that have occurred since then, how they've impacted the way we manage kidney stones and more importantly, patients. And then I'd like to take it a step further and talk a little bit about how these same scientific breakthroughs and medical technologies have impacted healthcare at large beyond that of urology. We have progressed greatly from a time whenever uh, we had primarily observational management and remedies to the 20th century when we literally opened a patient to go inside and extract the stone to now one where we have precise technologies to pinpoint the location of the stone and the size and multiple surgical technologies to be able to treat stones uh, and do so in a very highly successful manner. We also have medications that, that enable us to treat the pain that Tim alluded to and the nausea that goes along with passage of a kidney stone and even medicines that help you pass stones more readily. Here you see an example of shockwave lithotripsy in which focused energy is actually directed toward the kidney stones and fragments them, allowing them to pass more easily. And this is a really big breakthrough in the 1960s and 70s uh, that still carries on today. And we have another example here that I'd like to show you. So here we have, this is a scope, a delicate ureteroscope that actually allows us to traverse through the natural orifice or body up into the kidney and fragment and remove the stones. I know whenever I showed this to my son, he said, that goes where? <laughs> and this is really modern day technology. It's really not that novel. It's been around for 10 or 15 years, but they keep getting better and better. Now the good news is only about 10% of you in this room, or at one time around 30 people, it looks like the crowd's diminished a little bit, but around 30 of you have or will have a kidney stone in your life. I, I didn't see the show of hands for who's had them. Okay, all right. So for those of you who are in that 10% that have not had them yet, I do apologize because it's not fun, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone. But regardless of whether you're in the 10% or the 90%, we all will be a patient or a loved one of a patient at some point in our lifetime, whether it's 
caring for our daughter while she's having an ear infection treated, or taking care of your own broken arm in the emergency room, or helping your aging mother as she's dealing with chronic medical conditions in the latter part of her life. We've all seen uh, the impact of these treatments in the pediatrician's office, in the emergency department, or in dealing with payers uh, while helping your mother deal with her chronic medical conditions. And so we've seen that there are a lot of rolling stones or moving parts, if you will, in our healthcare system currently. We have indeed made a great deal of progress, whether it's antibiotics or vaccines or dialysis for uh, kidney failure or treatments for cancer, we were able to prevent and treat disease better than we ever imagined 50 or 100 years ago. And on the diagnostic side, we have fantastic tools like CAT scan and MRI and PET scans, which allow us to diagnose and also track disease in a really fantastic way. On the surgical side, which is what I do mostly, we, we have fine scopes like you've seen and laparoscopic surgery and even robotic surgery, which allow us to make smaller incisions or no incisions and therefore diminish the amount of pain that patients experience and also a, a speed along their recovery. And nowadays, with tools like telemedicine, wearable uh, sensors, remote monitoring, and even pharmacogenetics, we have a new level of personalized medicine uh, today that we never imagined, and really the possibilities are endless. And when you couple these with the enactment of the Affordable Care Act and the rollout of electronic medical record or the HIPAA compliance requirements that we have to adhere to or the rising cost of health care, you can see now that there is the most emphasis and focus on our health care system than there's ever been in our country's history. Now, I'd like to stand before you and say that with this progress, whether it's in kidney stone management or health care in general, that we never have any problems or any unforeseen consequences from the treatments that we give. But that wouldn't be true, because the reality is we do. And I know you're probably surprised you're expecting, you know, when a physician gets in one of these conferences and talks about technology, all you usually hear about is how good it is or how fantastic it will be, but not the realities that oftentimes these technologies will bring about. So I like to, to, to remember this, or I like to say this to my students and residents that work with me. We want to have the computer actually work for you and not vice versa. And oftentimes that's, that's really a problem with some of these technologies. As a patient, you may have seen that it's gotten harder and harder to get in to see your physician. And when you get in to see your doctor, the waiting room is packed. It takes forever to get back there. And oftentimes the workflow is slow, and you may have even been harmed in some way by some of the software products that are out. You probably also have noted that the power of the cell phone has definitely not been realized in healthcare as it has in banking or education or many of the other parts of our lives. And then when you finally get back to see your doctor, you may notice that at times the doctor is actually more focused on the computer in front of you rather than listening to you or your illness. Weren't these doctors the ones that were trained in medical school to listen to your symptoms, to feel where it hurts, to walk you through the options, to make you feel better, to make you well? Well, you've probably experienced some of the good parts and also some of these bad parts as a patient. And as a physician, you may feel like the treadmill that you're running on just keeps getting faster and faster and faster each year with changes in reimbursement or payer coverage or ever-increasing compliance requirements. A lot of the joy of medicine has probably been taken away from you. In fact, almost 50% of U.S. physicians have one of these symptoms, loss of enthusiasm, Feelings of cynicism, low sense of personal accomplishment in their work. Does anyone know what this is called? Burnout. That's right. In fact, 87% 87 of physicians reported the leading cause of work-related stress uh, and burnout to be due to paperwork and administration. And I would contend that oftentimes it has to do with the fact that the software processes that we have don't actually make it easier or patient care better. 
Now, almost half of the physicians reported spending over 30% of their day on administrative tasks. So let's think about this. They went to med school forever, went to residency forever, and now they spend a third of their day on a computer instead of direct interaction with their patients. One physician even went on to say, I am no longer a physician, but the data manager, data entry clerk, and steno girl. I became a doctor to take care of patients, but I become the typist. So which way do we go? On the one hand, we've made some great progress. We've made fantastic progress. But on the other hand, we still have work to do. Well, I have a few suggestions about how we might be able to approach not just kidney stone management and staying on track with it, but also healthcare in general that I'd like to share with you. So first off, in medicine, we all made a pledge for the most part to the Hippocratic Oath in which we stated to first do no harm. So regardless of whether or not you're a medical assistant triaging a patient in the emergency room or a urologist removing a kidney stone or a neurosurgeon conducting brain surgery, to first do no harm is always where we should start. And next, in 2008, Dr. Don Berwick, he put forth the concept of the triple aim. And who would argue that improving the patient experience, improving the quality of the health care for populations of people, and lowering costs are not worthwhile aims for our health care system? I believe that regardless of which side of the aisle you sit on politically, that we all can agree that these are worthwhile goals. But let's think about it for a second. On the one hand, we want to improve the patient experience. We want to improve quality for millions of Americans who have health care, and many of which who didn't a short time ago. And on the other hand, we also want to reduce the cost, and we want to do this with a fixed number of providers that really hasn't changed. I would contend that in that situation, something has got to give in order to make it happen. And this is the subject of a recent study that came out last year where Dr. Bodenheimer and Sinsky evaluated some of the institutions that were most successful in accomplishing the triple aim. And it's interesting what they found. What they found was that these institutions that were having great success also had the physicians, the highest burnout rate for physicians and the lowest morale, not just for the physicians, but also the healthcare team. And so they put forth a concept that maybe in addition to the triple aim, we ought to have one more, which is to improve the work life of the healthcare team. So in other words, they recognize that actually to give good care, you actually need to be healthy yourself. And I totally agree with that myself. Now, I realize that some of these concepts may be hard for you to relate to unless you're in healthcare or you, you're a physician. And so I wanted to share with you a little bit of my experience with uh, health care. So my wife, Honor, who's a pediatrician, uh, and I uh, accrued $100,000 worth of debt en route to finishing med school. That's $100,000 each. And then six years of residency, and then two years of fellowship to finish at a ripe age of 35 to start life in the real world. Oh, and along the way, we also happen to have triplets, too. <laughs> and I'm still not quite sure whether or not it was the training or the triplets, but somehow I turned gray before I was 40. <laughs> but in any case, I'm really happy about the wisdom that came along with it, and hopefully that'll help you understand a little bit more about what it's like from our side. But I want you to realize that we're really no different to be honest, we're just one story of tens of thousands of the brightest students in our country who elect to go into health care, only to find that when they finish, the rules of their work, the reimbursement, their uh, quality of life, the hours they're required, all those uh, circumstances are constantly changing, and, and they have little control over that. And I'm worried, I'm worried that these these individuals with all these years of experience may one day just eventually decide, you know what, I'll do something else. And where would that put our healthcare system? 
I think that's something that we need to consider in moving forward. So let's review first, do no harm. Now the four parts of the quadruple aim, enhancing patient experience, improving population health, reducing costs, improving the work life of the healthcare team, and lastly, the power of the individual and teams. And this is a theme that you've heard a few times today. I, for one, do believe that each individual can take advantage, or each team can take advantage of the opportunities in front of them in their everyday work life to try to make the system better and not become overwhelmed by all the things that you cannot do or cannot control. In my practice as a urologist, I actually specialize in pediatric urology, and I work at a fine institution here in town with an excellent team. And we have sought out certain opportunities to be able to utilize some of these breakthroughs and technologies in our practice, and one of which is in robotic surgery. And here you see a picture from one of my patients who actually knew that I liked and had an interest in robotic surgery. And so I'm happy to say that we built a robotic team that actually now provides minimally invasive or small incisions with very precise reconstruction for urologic problems in kids, allowing them to get home sooner and have less scar scarring. Also, we've utilized telemedicine in certain instances, such as in post-operative follow-up or prenatal consultation. And these are just a few examples of how you can use the current breakthroughs and technology to make care better in your own world. Now, this same opportunity as an individual to make care better is not limited to standard physician office or hospital setting, but industry is also a place where this can occur. I'm part of a small uh, startup, Little Rock-based company called Physit, which has focused on the transition of care for patients after being discharged from the hospital back to home. And this is a very big problem in healthcare, very costly and very significant for patients who are ill and, and more, very likely to go back into the hospital. And after a year of researching the, project, or the, the problem and actually tailoring a solution around it, we have created a, a solution that actually helps providers track a few key steps to help keep patients out of the hospital after they're discharged. And now uh, the problem is actually being solved by this solution in that we have the, uh, approximately 20 offices using it, hundreds of patients tracked, reduced readmissions, reduced overall cost of care, increased profit for the physician's office, and most importantly, more close monitoring of patients after they actually leave the hospital. So that sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Kind of like the aims of the quadruple aim. So you can do this in business as well. Now, in general, I would like to say that the progress that we've made in scientific advancement and also technology and healthcare far outweighs the problems or some of the ones that I've actually outlined here. But we still have some more work to go. So I'd like to close by recalling the old adage, a rolling stone gathers no moss. Now, and the reason why it gathers no moss is because of its avoidance of responsibility. Now, in kidney stone management, the rolling of the stone, if you will, is good in that the problem will soon pass, while the downside is that you will soon experience pain while you're passing it. And in the case of the healthcare system, progress forward is also good, but the downside is that there will be some unforeseen consequences and some difficulties along the way. But we cannot allow this to happen at the expense of our responsibility to patient care. In fact, I contend that with this progress, we have an opportunity and even a responsibility to do what we can do to make our country and the health of its citizens better. And hopefully, the masterpiece that our healthcare system will become is one that Michelangelo might be proud of. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm not going to die? <laughs> no. Okay, well, good. not anymore. I got seven ago. and a half extra minutes of oh. life earlier. I heard yeah. I played a game. A, a hundred years ago, you might have from a kidney stone. You know, I actually thought about that when I had that experience. I thought, 
wow, uh, I'm so grateful, grateful that we have the medical resources and the healthcare system that we have now uh, versus what we had 100 years ago right. because, I mean, it could have been a serious... And then talking to other people that have dealt with that and knowing that they could have been a lot worse yeah. than the ones that I experienced and require surgery and all some of the pre procedures that you yeah. showed. It literally could be a death sentence. Well, li like I was saying, you, you really don't want to see the scope while you're awake, but while you're asleep, <laughs> you know, you're glad that it's right. there. I'm glad it's there. Yeah. Right, yeah. So... Um, on the subject of, of healthcare in a, in a very broad sense, I asked these questions of Dr. Lowry earlier, mm -hmm. uh, and I'd like to get your insights on sure. some of the same, same uh, technology and your thoughts on that. You mentioned telemedicine. I asked him about virtual reality and augmented reality. Just in a, in a general sense, um, where do you see those types of technologies? What do you think is next, and how do they affect not just our ability to lead healthier lives, but to have a more affordable, effective healthcare system? Well, uh, with virtual reality, certainly educational opportunities are there. Uh, also with, uh, with patients, any kind of connection with the patient while they're at home and while they don't have to come into the doctor's office would be a huge step forward. And what you're talking about would be a gigantic leap forward. So unfortunately, the complexities of the healthcare system, I think, will limit that to some degree in the near Regulation future. Regulation? Well, well, I mean, you know, when you have a you know, third-party payer system and you've got competing influences, right. uh, it's hard to uh, get everyone aligned, okay? So eventually if we could get all those uh, parties aligned, then the, the, the possibilities with technology really are endless. That's the first step. So tell me a little bit more, if, if I can ask, about FISIT mm -hmm. and programs such as that and how they're going to help improve uh, client, or I'm sorry, uh, patient-doctor relationships sure. and communication. Well, sure. So, um, you know, basically the intent of FISIT is to make uh, a solution for a specific problem that's not managed by the electronic medical record. So, uh, you know, I alluded to this in my talk, electronic medical record definitely has a ways to go. And I think, you know, quite frankly, you know, industrial engineers or UI people, uh, user interface could really make those better. But there are a lot of solutions that they have not created and they don't have the time or resources to do. So the intent of the, of the program is to basically help. And in fact, we integrate with one electronic record to do just that. So there are a lot of possibilities that will end up, again, meeting all those aims, helping make care better, making more money for, in certain instances while lowering the overall cost of care, and then in the end, helping patients be better, which is what we need. So that, that's the vision for it. Great. Thanks, Thank Doctor. Thank you very Appreciate much. It.